Hi everyone and I would like to wish you all a warm welcome to today's lecture titled the CRISPR-9, CRISPR-Cas9 based lateral flow and fluorescence diagnostics for SARS-CoV-2 infections, which is organized by the Student Society for Molecular Biology. So the lecture we're about to hear today is going to be held by Professor Mark J. Osborne from the University of Minnesota. And a little bit about today's lecturer. So Dr. Osborne is an assistant professor at the Department of Pediatrics, so the Division of Blood and Marrow Transplantation. He is also a member of the Cancer Center. So Dr. Osborne received his PhD degree from the University of Minnesota, the same one he is employed by in 2009. What we're most interested in is Dr. Osborne's current research, which is focused on gene and cellular therapy for disorders treated by hematopoietic cell transplantation, including the Fanconi anemia and Hurler syndrome. This involves utilizing a patient's own cells for precision gene targeting and correction of the disease causing mutation. Genome editing nucleases in multiple terminally differentiated and stem cell, stem, stem cell populations are utilized towards optimizing ex vivo cellular therapies. Thank you so much for joining us today, Professor. The floor is yours. Thank you so much for uh, the kind introduction uh, and the um, invitation. I'm, I'm truly honored to be here and uh, it is uh, an honor to speak with all, you all uh, this evening. And good morning from the United States. And uh, uh, as was mentioned, my work focuses on um, gene and cellular therapy uh, for inherited and acquired genetic uh, conditions. Uh, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, my laboratory uh, uh, started to pivot toward diagnostics using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. And so uh, typically our work um, sorry, just let me figure the PowerPoint out. Here we go. Um, is uh, built around uh, genome editing platforms. And we employ uh, the four major uh, DNA editing platforms, megatel nucleases, zinc finger nucleases, transcription activator like effector nucleases or talons, uh, and of course, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, these are differential platforms in terms of overall architecture. Uh, but they all have the important commonality of that they can be programmed to bind a user-specific nucleic acid sequence. Uh, and so, again, we employ these in my laboratory uh, for ablating gene expression, knocking out genes uh, using the error-prone DNA repair pathway, uh, most commonly that proceeds through non-homologous end joining. And so a nuclease can be introduced into a target cell population it cleaves the DNA. Uh, the DNA ends following a double strand of DNA break are resected. Uh, and in that process, uh, base pairs are either added or lost uh, to uh, introduce insertions or deletions. And that can lead to an out of frame uh, DNA repair event that can lead to gene disruption. And so we've used this uh, for T cells in the chimeric antigen receptor therapy space for immune therapy, uh, as well as mechanistically to introduce mutations uh, in target cell populations to uh, allow us to study the mechanistic uh, underpinnings of uh, disease processes. The other arm of DNA repair uh, that my laboratory uh, uh, is very interested in is the error-free DNA repair pathway, where following a double-stranded DNA break, uh, it can be repaired by a more precise mechanism called homology-directed repair. This requires an exogenous repair template that shares homology to the target sequence, and within that, we can incorporate user-defined bases. So we use this for uh, incorporating novel sequences, uh, for instance, correcting uh, disease-causing mutations uh, and uh, employ this for ex vivo strategies where we can obtain patient cells, correct them with the hopes of then infusing them back in, uh, again, in the context of blood and marrow transplant or cellular therapy. Uh, we're also very interested uh, in the DNA base editing technology, uh, but I'm not gonna speak um, uh, about those uh, repair 
uh, strategies today. Uh, I'm going to focus more on our efforts for diagnostics using uh, DNA binding. And that's really the, the key component is being able to use a programmable reagent that allows us to interrogate and bind a user-defined sequence uh, in the context of disease. We do this for target genes. But it also put us on a platform in response to the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic uh, to employ it for detecting SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid. This has been um, uh, encompassed in uh, methodologies that allow for more streamlined uh, diagnostics uh, that in the early days of the pandemic, uh, testing was, was essentially non-existent and uh, now uh, there's in, in the state, I'm in, in in Minneapolis, Minnesota, our state uh, performs between 30 and 50,000 tests per day. Typically these are from uh, quantitative reverse transcript, transcription PCR, uh, which requires specialized methodology. Also in our state, uh, in the city of Minneapolis, which is uh, a population of about, 1 million people. Um, there's a large population center. And so QRT-PCR can be uh, scaled and performed in this urban setting. Uh, if we go approximately 30 miles outside of uh, Minneapolis, uh, there's a large uh, uh, rural setting. And so the population decreases and the geographic space increases. So there's fewer people. And so we're interested in being able to robustly uh, put forward diagnostic platforms that rather than those samples having to be collected and then shipped into uh, the Twin Cities, uh, that they the test can be performed out uh, in the field or closer to the point of care. And that alleviates long turnaround times that right now is still between 24 and 48 hours. And we'd like to do this from uh, allow rural settings or less infrastructure intensive areas to be able to perform tests uh, with short 12 hour uh, or less turnaround times. And so we built a uh, platform uh, for accomplishing this using CAS9. And so I'm gonna discuss some of the other CAS platforms uh, that have been used that were truly the foundational ones that, that uh, we and others have built our work off of, uh, as well as the readouts for how these are detected, whether it's colorimetric fluorescent, uh, as well as lateral flow assay technology. And uh, I'll also discuss amplification technologies that allow for more streamlined and robust amplification, uh, and then end on some of our isolation and enhanced detection capabilities that we're uh, using, again, with the overall goal of being able to perform tests closer to the patient, closer to the point of collection uh, in these areas that have less infrastructure uh, to allow, allow for rapid turnaround times. So detection uh, really is uh, crucial in terms of specificity to minimize false positives and negatives. Uh, for quantitative RT-PCR, the uh, false positive and negative rates are, are, are quite low. For some of the, the CAS-based uh, methodologies, as, as some of uh, our early work will show, I'll walk you through our process, is that we had unacceptably high false positive rates. And, and, and that really built uh, the project uh, toward defining better ways to minimize those false positive events. Uh, also, detection is based upon availabilities. Uh, I, I mentioned that QRT-PCR typically uh, now has about a 24-hour turnaround time to results. Uh, in the earlier days, it was closer to three or four days, um, making availability a key consideration. Uh, but also from the standpoint of allowing researchers to use the methodology. Uh, in the U.S., when the pandemic uh, first started, uh, testing uh, was plagued by contamination, and so the tests weren't available. And so we uh, wanted to make it more uh, available to the research community, to the academic community, the, to the clinical community using a commercialized approach uh, to use off-the-shelf reagents to build a test platform that then would be flexible uh, and streamlined for use, which are, are critical considerations. So in the evolution of CRISPR diagnostics, uh, the, the, the key 
uh, entryway into this uh, diagnostic space was really forged by uh, Dr. Jennifer Doudna, who of course received the uh, Nobel Prize last year, and Dr. Feng Zhang, uh, and, and they are uh, laboratories that have been pioneers in the overall CRISPR-Cas9 space, uh, as well as other Cas enzymes. And it really is defined on the properties of these Cas enzymes, <clears throat> excuse me, where they can bind a user to spine sequence, whether that be DNA or RNA, uh, and then they mediate an effect, typically some kind of nuclease event. And in the case of Cas12, uh, the overall architecture is such that the enzyme is guided to, in this case, a double-stranded DNA target by a CRISPR RNA uh, that conjugates with the Cas12 enzyme. That then interrogates the uh, uh, nucleic acid sequence, and base pairing occurs by uh, uh, Watson Crick base pairing. And there is a requirement for a PAM or a proto spacer adjacent motif uh, that essentially acts as uh, the catalytic uh, component to trigger nuclease activity. So the uh, Cas enzyme scans across a target, and then when a PAM uh, is encountered, the nuclease event takes place. And this confers both specificity uh, and activity properties. And so there are different CAS orthologs uh, that have different PAM identities or requirements. Uh, for CAS12, it's a uh, polythymine uh, region. And so that's a requirement for engaging the nuclease activity. CAS13, on the other hand, while architecturally similar in that it requires a CRISPR RNA to guide it to a, uh, a sequence, in this case, single-stranded RNA, there isn't a PAM requirement. And so PAMs can uh, somewhat restrict the targeting capability of these enzymes. And so Cas13 is much more flexible in that it doesn't require this uh, typically three or four base pair sequence. Following CRISPR-Cas, I'm sorry, uh, uh, CRISPR RNA conjugating to a Cas enzyme, scanning a nucleic acid target, and finding a highly uh, homologous sequence, uh, cleavage occurs. And again, the properties of that can be different, whether it's a single-stranded staggered cut, uh, or in the case of Cas9, it can be a single-stranded cut, a double-stranded cut, uh, based on the overall architecture. And again, the target type is different between the Cas enzymes and, and different Cas enzymes can be employed for different uh, uh, approaches uh, to allow for either single-stranded, double-stranded or single DNA or single-stranded RNA uh, targeting, uh, which allows from a diagnostics platform, the ability to target both DNA and RNA targets. Uh, Cas12 and Cas13 have very interesting properties that are uh, somewhat deleterious from uh, uh, work that we would do clinically in that once a target is identified, uh, it cleaves that target, but then it also acquires promiscuous activity for any either DNA or RNA target. And so in the context of uh, clinical work, this would be uh, contraindicated because it would lead to massive DNA or RNA targeting, uh, which would be toxic to the cell. Uh, Drs. Doudna and, and Zhang, uh, again, to their uh, high caliber um, of, of, of science and thinking, uh, realized that this could be used for diagnostic uh, purposes, such that a target sequence could be uh, interrogated with either Cas12 or Cas13, and then a secondary reporter could be cleaved to generate a signal that is actually then detected. And so this uh, collateral DNA, uh, DNA or RNA uh, activity leads to the uh, promise of, of diagnostics. And so Dr. Doudna's group uh, uh, first uh, introduced CAS-based um, diagnostics for a platform called Detector or DNA Endonuclease Targeted CRISPR Transreporter. Uh, again, this is CAS-12 based. It uh, uses single-stranded DNA cleavage. And again, there's a CRISPR RNA dependent event that requires target acquisition of a user-defined sequence, say a virus, bacteria, uh, or, or whatever the target may be. And then once that sequence is encountered, the enzyme requires non-specific cutting capability, uh, and by introducing a probe, uh, it can then be cleaved and detected, whether by fluorescence or lateral flow assays. 
Similarly, Dr. Zhang's lab introduced Sherlock or specific high sensitivity on enzymatic reporter unlocking that's cast 13 base, but again requires this collateral damage. So rather than detecting DNA, it detects RNA. Once it encounters that RNA target, there's promiscuous activity for other RNA molecules uh, such that a uh, probe can be introduced or a reporter probe. So following cast 13 binding, the RNA sensor becomes a target for this collateral RNA uh, damage and can be cleaved and generate a signal. And uh, again, these are just overviews of, of both methodologies, but really the take home is that there's two events. It has to bind the uh, user defined sequence that's dictated by the user uh, scientist or, or, or operator to synthesize a CRISPR RNA that conjugates with the Cas enzyme that then uh, binds through Watson quick crick base pairing to a target nucleic acid sequence. And this requires a specific interaction. And once that specific interaction occurs, then a nonspecific triggering of either uh, DNA or RNA collateral cleavage occurs. And that again becomes important for generating a signal that can be detected. And this, uh, I'll discuss two ways to accomplish this, uh, which is lateral flow assay technology shown on the left or fluorescent signal generation, which can be uh, measured and, and uh, uh, in, in uh, using a, a more specialized it, it, uh, instrumentation. Uh, while lateral flow assays are, are technology that's very similar to home pregnancy testing and that allows for more streamlined and infrastructure um, uh, less infrastructure intensive areas can perform these assays. And uh, so these are CAS-12 and CAS-13. Again, that requires this collateral damage, uh, 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 cleavage event to generate a signal. Uh, and while these are important, when these were first uh, described, CAS-12 or CAS-13 weren't commercially available and only recently have become so. And so they were somewhat restrictive for people who wanted to enter this space to design assays because it required that person or that laboratory to uh, synthesize and purify their own protein. CAS-9, which the research community uh, has had much more experience with, uh, has also been employed for this. And I think marks a shift in making it more amenable uh, for broader application where uh, CAS-9 has been commercially available for a much longer period as opposed to CAS-12 and CAS-13 uh, and has been employed for diagnostics uh, in a similar fashion in that the binding properties of CAS-9 can be leveraged to interrogate and bind a user-defined sequence, bacteria, uh, virus, or whatever the analyte uh, one wants to uh, uh, interrogate using the Cas9 enzyme and a uh, um, guide RNA. And that binding event can again be detected whether through fluorescence or lateral flow assay technology. A hurdle to Cas9 uh, has been the ability to efficiently detect it on lateral flow assays. Uh, and I'll, I'll discuss um, uh, briefly the requirements for that, but it really requires a, a dual laboring approach, uh, typically of uh, FITSI, uh, the fluorescent molecule, and biotin. And the collateral activity of Cas12 and Cas13 lends itself quite well to that because a uh, small synthetic probe can be employed to accomplish that. Cas9, uh, uh, in, in contrast, uh, the architecture has required a specialized reformatting of the guide RNA and then a gold nanoparticle to attach to that specific region of the guide RNA to fulfill the binding requirements for resolution on um, uh, lateral flow assays. And so uh, this is a specialized component that again makes it somewhat restrictive for uh, both academic and, and clinical investigators. But um, building the, the platform for lateral flow assay technology, which are, are commercially available and, and, and many of them require a uh, uh, analyte to be duly labeled, one with a uh, FITSI or fluorescein isothiocyanate, which is a, a fluorophore, uh, and then biotin. And the reason for this is that the lateral flow assays have gold nanoparticles decorated with rabbit anti-FITSI antibodies. And so a molecule that's labeled with FITSI is coated with these gold nanoparticles. It then flows across this um, uh, 
assay um, strip, uh, which is just a small uh, strip of, of essentially Wattman paper, uh, where then at embedded in the strip is a uh, streptavidin molecule. And so if the corresponding DNA or RNA target, uh, as well as, as, as protein, is also labeled with um, biotin, it's then captured at that test band. And the gold nanoparticles accumulate uh, to a threshold level and then can be visualized uh, with the naked eye. Uh, if the uh, molecule is not conjugated with both Bitsy and biotin, uh, then nothing is captured at the streptavin and the test band uh, and is read as a, a negative result. And so the analyte has to be uh, marked or labeled with both Bitsy and biotin in order for a positive signal uh, to be observed. And so really the labeling of that was what my laboratory was interested in pursuing uh, and doing so in a way that would make it feasible for use by uh, any academic or uh, um, uh, clinical laboratory using commercial reagents. Uh, and so that's the lateral flow assay component of it. Again, it's an analyte that requires FITSI and biotin marking. Uh, also, there is more infrastructure intensive uh, methodologies using um, either colorimetric or fluorescence. Uh, and while this requires more specialized uh, instrumentation and maybe some more specialized uh, trainer operating, uh, 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 operational training for a, a technician, um, it does allow for higher throughput and the potential for multiplexing. So using different fluorescent colors uh, to detect multiple analytes simultaneously. And so I'll talk about that, uh, how we employed those properties. Uh, and so we envision this as a platform where we can perform point of care diagnostics as well as higher throughput um, uh, in the laboratory based setting using more specialized uh, instrumentation to detect fluorescence. So overall, the CRISPR-based detection platforms uh, are based on the specificity and binding capability of CRISPR uh, that allows for analyte detection, whether it be nucleic acids or uh, peptides. Uh, those can be uh, uh, visualized on lateral flow assays or fluorescence. Um, and again, many of these techniques still require some special reagents or techniques that can be prohibitive to, for um, a new laboratory to uh, uh, acquire the specialist, specialized either reagents or training to um, uh, make these operational. And so our goal uh, in response to the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic was to develop a Cas9-based detection platform using wholly commercial available reagents. And, and that uh, allowed us to obtain these uh, without having to do specialized uh, chemistry or acquisition of reagents and, and hope, hopefully makes it more accessible to the academic and clinical communities. And so operating on the principle that uh, lateral flow assay technologies can be performed closer to the patient at the point of collection, uh, we, we started to uh, um, build a program around how could we detect uh, these um, nucleic acids using lateral flow assay technology, which again require a uh, FITSI and biotin labeled uh, analyte. And uh, what we first did was use dual labeled primers, one forward labeled PCR primer labeled with FITSI, which is as, uh, uh, a simple chemical modification that uh, most uh, oligonucleotide vendors offer. Likewise with biotin, these can be physically conjugated to the oligonucleotide and, and easily ordered from uh, most companies that produce oligonucleotides. And so principally, this was a, a relatively simplistic uh, question to ask is, could we generate uh, dual labeled PCR products and resolve them on lateral flow assays in that DNA amplification uh, would incorporate FITSI and biotin and would allow us uh, to label that DNA uh, template and resolve it on a lateral flow assay. And so what we did was tested that uh, plus or minus a template. 
And uh, in the absence of a 10 plate, what we saw was that at higher primer concentrations, we saw a band, which is the lower one at the black arrow, uh, at the test band. Uh, and so this was, um, uh, in the absence of a 10 plate, was likely due to primer dimerization, that the two primers had some physical interaction uh, whereby Fitzy and Biotin were now physically linked and were now uh, observed at the test band. By diminishing the primer concentration, we avoided that. So at 3.5 micromolar of primers, uh, this effect was, was lost. Uh, however, when we then performed PCR under these conditions, we also saw a loss of sensitivity. So the intensity of the band uh, diminishes as the primer concentration diminishes, which isn't surprising that the, the lack of availability of primers results in less robust uh, detection, which could uh, re result in lower uh, sensitivity that might be prohibitive and uh, preclude accurate diagnostics. And so we then started to look at uh, CRISPR-based methodologies where we could uh, interrogate this sequence following PCR uh, to label uh, the analyte. And shown at top is the SARS-CoV-2 genome. Uh, and uh, important constituents of this uh, are shown uh, with the red arrows. Those are the sites that the World Health Organization or the Centers for Disease Control respectively uh, have their target for quantitative RT-PCR. That's where their uh, tests uh, analyze and detect uh, the SARS-CoV-2 genome. When we started to do this based off the specificity of CRISPR-Cas9, which we know has a protospacer adjacent motif of uh, NGG, where N is any nucleotide and, and G is guanine, uh, we looked for uh, differential uh, sequence. And one of the early variants of concerns, and this was in uh, uh, January of last year, uh, showed a, a polymorphic region in the ORF8 gene. And this is a gene that's uh, involved in, in SARS-CoV-2 uh, endoplasmic, endoplasmic reticulum transport. But one of the early studies uh, showed that there was a polymorphic region and one uh, variant uh, uh, had a, uh, um, uh, base proximal to a protospacer adjacent motif. And this small window proximal to the protospacer adjacent motif is, is termed the seed sequence uh, and confers greater specificity. So targeting as close as we can to the PAM sequence confers greater specificity because it's believed that the guide RNA kind of unwinds from the three prime to the five prime end and greater specificity or interaction is obtained uh, the more homology there is at the three prime end of the guide RNA. And so uh, it it would potentially allow us to have a single nucleotide polymorphism uh, resolution for using this specific variant of concern that was first identified, uh, was the first variant of concern identified in the United States. And of course, there's uh, been other variants that have now predominated, but the, the uh, uh, concept was, can we now uh, start to differentiate potential variants of concern using this uh, technology? And so building upon uh, the fact that we know uh, lateral flow assay technology requires a FITSI biotin labeled analyte. Uh, however, that when those molecules are incorporated into uh, the primers during uh, uh, PCR results in false primers, we hypothesize that we could uncouple those events, meaning that we could amplify the DNA target with a FITSI labeled forward primer and an unlabeled reverse primer. Uh, and uh, as I said, lateral flow assay technology requires this secondary biotin binding event in order to uh, allow for detection. And we hypothesized that we could use a, a biotin related version of Cas9, which is again, commercially available from Sigma to allow us now to label this, to fulfill the requirements of a FITSI and biotin on the same molecule to um, uh, detect it by lateral flow assay technology. And to do so in a, a manner that was guide RNA or specific uh, to a COVID-19 guide RNA. And so our first attempts at this uh, showed that, again, uh, labeling the primers directly resulted in uh, false positives. Again, the test band is the black arrow, the blue arrow is the control band. Uh, and even in the absence of a template, we observed uh, positive um, uh, signal even in the um, 
absence of a template due to primer dimerization. We then uncoupled those events as uh, using a FITC forward primer, unlabeled reverse primer, and then added Cas9 that's biotinylated. And we were surprised to see that even in the mismatch guide RNA, so a control guide RNA, amplifying a SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid, uh, and then using a COVID-19 guide RNA, we do see a, uh, a, a test band at the black arrow. But in the mismatch one, we also saw a very faint band. And what we thought this might be is that Cas9 uh, scans a large uh, um, frequency of DNA searching for a target uh, that fulfills the Watson-Crick base pairing as well as the protospacer adjacent motif. And that uh, uh, interaction then triggers the nuclease activity. So what we thought uh, when we saw this is that Cas9 was scanning and that there's still, still some interaction uh, that uh, had some promiscuity in binding. And so to alleviate that, we hypothesized that we could have a decoy or a bait uh, a nucleic acid sequence rich in NGG PAMs. And the hypothesis being that if we provide this, then any nonspecific Cas9 binding would be soaked up by this um, competing sponge DNA, uh, which is just a short oligonucleotide sequence. And so again, the principle is we amplified COVID-19 uh, uh, DNA with a FITC labeled forward primer, unlabeled reverse, added biotinylated dead Cas9, and then included this competing DNA. Uh, and in the absence of the DNA, a mismatch or un, uh, nonspecific uh, guide RNA resulted in a uh, faint band. And then when we added this um, competing sponge DNA decoy, uh, it, it um, drove specificity solely to the uh, target guide RNA that was matched perfectly for um, the, the DNA amplicon. So by adding this sponge or soak DNA, uh, it prevented this nonspecific scanning uh, activity and allowed us to achieve specificity. So overall, this allowed us to uh, detect it in a robust fashion where we could generate a PCR product and then interrogate it with Cas9 that's biotinylated in the presence of this decoy uh, that drives specificity toward the target molecule and allowed us uh, to uh, robustly detect SARS-CoV-2 nucleic acid templates. Building off this principle, we then ask the question, can we achieve single base pair resolution? Uh, and to do this, we tested that original uh, um, DNA uh, decoy uh, that I just showed that was somewhat nonspecific in, in regards to it. It was just a PAM-rich sequence that would allow for Cas9 interaction. And uh, then we mismatched a, uh, um, a guide RNA to a target amplicon, meaning that we had uh, amplicons that in the SARS-CoV-2 genome either were a thymine or a cytosine, uh, and that was related to a variant of a concern, variant of concern. And so if we had a thymine target DNA and a COVID-19 uh, guide RNA that was perfectly matched, uh, we then uh, were able to uh, um, use a bait oligonucleotide that was mismatched by one base pair at that cytosine residue. And so shown uh, in the left for uh, lateral flow assay strips is that when we have a thymine target DNA plus a thymine guide RNA, but now the decoy is for a cytosine or a one base pair mismatch, uh, we can uh, specifically target the thymine and the ability of the cytosine guide RNA uh, is eliminated from being able to detect that. Uh, this is in distinction from the previous decoy oligonucleotide that was unable to promote single base pair resolution. Uh, the corresponding cytosine interaction was also observed where, where if we mismatched the bait DNA by one base pair, we were able to achieve single nucleotide resolution. So this allowed us now uh, to potentially identify variants of concern uh, using lateral flow assay technology with a specialized uh, bait DNA that promoted better on target and prevented uh, promiscuous binding if there was a one base pair mismatch.
So these reagents, again, are all commercially available, the lateral flow assay technology, uh, the uh, Cas9 and um, oligonucleotides, which are, are e uh, easy to acquire, uh, allowed us to initiate this uh, testing platform. Uh, what we found is that with a nuclease inactive biotinylated guide uh, uh, um, Cas9, uh, that it required a sponge or soak or decoy DNA that, that, that um, prevented non-specific interaction of, of, of uh, mismatched guide RNAs uh, with a specialized um, mismatch competing DNA. We were able to achieve single nucleotide polymorphism uh, level of detection. Uh, and what we did for this proof of concept uh, was use endpoint PCR, so thermocycler-based uh, PCR for to establish the overall testing methodology, which of course is not conducive for rapid field testing. So the next question we wanted to ask was, can we uh, use these isothermal amplification techniques uh, using either recombinase polymerase amplification or, or LAMP PCR or loop mediated isothermal amplification. Isothermal is really the key word, meaning it can be performed uh, either uh, uh, between 37 and 42 degrees in, in most cases. Um, and we all showed that we also did this at room temperature, so it doesn't require um, a specialized heating block. Uh, quickly, the, the mechanism for recombinase polymerase amplification which is a phenomenal reagent, again, uh, uh, obtainable uh, as lyophilized reagents from a company called Twist Diagnostics. Uh, it comes prepackaged in tubes, so the, the material is just added to these tubes uh, and can be performed at room temperature. And, and, and in those tubes is a reagent mixture of um, uh, recombinase polymerase amplification promoting um, uh, 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 reagents uh, comprised of recombinase proteins that open up the DNA strand, uh, single-stranded bi binding proteins that uh, stabilize primer interaction, and then there's a DNA polymerase that allows for robust um, amplification. Similarly, loop, loop amplification mediated PCR is similar in concept in, in that it has a DNA polymerase that can robustly amplify DNA. Uh, it's different than from recombinase polymerase amplification in that there's a specialized primer architecture that needs to be uh, incorporated into the primers in order for the polymerase to attach uh, and synthesize DNA. Uh, both methodologies result in, in very uh, robust DNA amplification. Uh, we chose RPA because uh, there's no specialized uh, primer requirements, where with LAMP PCR, because of these uh, hairpins or loops that need to be included in the primer design, it uh, can be somewhat difficult to optimize. So we asked the question based uh, again on the earlier work uh, by Drs. Doudna and, and Zhang using all the components in one reaction or a one pot um, reaction mix whereby uh, the nucleic acid that's to be amplified uh, is included with the Cas enzyme to allow for detection simultaneously. And so we perform RPA in the presence of this biotinylated Cas9. And, and what we were surprised to see was that even with massive amounts of of, a compo of that competing um, uh, uh, sponge DNA is that we saw false negative, uh, I'm sorry, false positive results, again, shown with the black band. Uh, and these are um, both with a COVID-19 guide RNA, but importantly, what showed the false positive was, was the mismatch guide RNA. So there was something um, prohibitive for having these reagents in the same tube. So then what we did was we uncoupled them and, and did them in two steps. So we did the recombinase polymerase amplification in one step, took a portion of that for this, the downstream detection by Cas9. Uh, and what this allowed us then to do was to detect it uh, in, in rapid fashion. So the recombinase polymerase amplification takes 20 minutes at, at room temperature and then taking a portion of that for uh, the lateral flow component by adding Cas9 that's biotinylated uh, with this decoy uh, DNA that's at different um, concentrations. What, what, what we observed was that at two micromolar uh, that the Cas9 then incubated with that DNA uh, that's been amplified by RPA uh, in as little as 20 minutes is observable. And as, as it uh, progresses over the next uh, 40 to 60 minutes, um, it becomes even clearer. So uh, what we settled on was a 20 minute 
recombinase polymerase amplification, uh, and then a 60 minute Cas9 to avoid any uh, presence of a, a false test band. And so um, these showed that uh, we could, with the streamlined uh, amplification diagnostics procedures, uh, um, uh, achieve um, for deployable uh, detection methodologies. And then we, we asked the question, at, at what sensitivity? And so going back to the targeting schema I showed of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, uh, I showed that the uh, our Centers for Disease Control, or CDC, uh, detects uh, the N gene using quantitative RT-PCR. So we, with our ORF-8A detection strategy, uh, use SARS-CoV-2 genomes and did a dilution series compared our ability to detect uh, um, ORF-8A at the resolution of N1 or N2 with the CDC um, uh, QRT-PCR. And what we observed by lateral, piece, uh, lateral flow assay technology is that it was about an order of magnitude less. And this is due to the sensitivity that the uh, ability to detect a test band, again, which is this black band in the lateral flow assay, is visually based, is optically based, uh, which has some uh, um, lowered sensitivity, certainly in, in um, uh, comparison to fluorescence detection, uh, but because fluorescence detection requires more specialized instrumentation, uh, likely at a more specialized laboratory, we also have a collaboration where we can amplify the signal of uh, the lateral flow assay uh, using thermal contrast amplification. And this is based on the properties of the gold nanoparticles that coat uh, the, the test analyte and accumulate at the test band. And so we can um, use a small footprint uh, reader that we've developed that uh, uses an infra infrared source uh, to illuminate the test band uh, with a heat source that heats the gold nanoparticles and the infra infrared heat signature is directly portion proportional to the number of gold nanoparticles there. And so it acts as a quantitative measurement of the number of gold nanoparticles, which are related to the number of overall nucleic acid or analyte um, uh, molecules that are, are, are present. And so by taking the lateral flow assay uh, that we have previously observed visually using this new reader, we can uh, uh, increase the sensitivity by between 30 and 50%. <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, proof of principle for this was uh, studies that we, our collaborator did with influenza A or B. Uh, but we're now doing this with SARS-CoV-2, and this is a very small footprint reader, uh, very easy to insert the uh, test strips and obtain, obtain a, uh, a readout in, in rapid order, but it's based upon the principle of shining a laser on the test band, the gold nanoparticles heat up and that heat signature can be measured and that's directly proportional uh, to the number of gold nanoparticles and therefore the number of diagnostic molecules that are, have uh, uh, accumulated at this test band. So it, add, it adds essentially uh, gives us PCR resolution uh, without having to do thermocycler-based PCR. We also um, wanted to pursue the fluorescence detection capability, again, because of the sensitivity issue, but as well as a scalability. Uh, again, uh, it's common for many public health departments here to perform tens of thousands of tests per day. Uh, and so we wanted to ask the question, could we streamline the uh, uh, and, and, and increase throughput of this methodology uh, using fluorescence detection? And so we asked whether we could develop a Cas9 based approach for this using a uh, probe very similar to what would be used for quantitative RT-PCR. It's a fluorescence molecule uh, with a uh, sequence of DNA separating a quencher molecule. And so in the absence of any cleavage, this molecule is suppressed in its fluorescence emission. And then following binding and cleavage by Cas9, a fluorescent signal is emitted that can be um, detected. And so we use this uh, with Cas9 uh, nuclease rather than the biotinylated nuclease inactive version. We use the nuclease properties of Cas9 and then used uh, two different control guide RNAs that are mismatched to the 
uh, COVID-19 target. And then when we had a matched COVID-19 guide RNA, uh, it allowed for robust fluorescence activation and it 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 di was differentiated uh, to a statistically significant uh, fashion in about ten minutes, and so it streamlined uh, both the throughput as well as sensitivity and speed with which we could perform these assays. Comparing it to uh, quantitative RT-PCR, uh, where the lateral flow assay was about an order of magnitude less, uh, the fluorescence assay uh, was nearly identical in sensitivity to the quantitative RT-PCR, uh, but uh, at about uh, half the time it takes to do quantitative RT-PCR. And so we we're able to use RPA-generated DNA amplicons incorporate uh, a probe uh, and then expose it to Cas9 nuclease to generate a fluorescent signal. And again, in uh, typically 10 to 15 minutes, this, this uh, signal was differential between uh, uh, controls and COVID-19 samples uh, and very specific in that the control guide RNA did not generate a, fl a fluorescent signal. And so it allows for uh, um, streamlined uh, application and diagnostics using fluorescence emission. Uh, and it also allowed us then to incorporate different colors for a multiplex approach where uh, when we were developing this, uh, there was still, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, uh, initial wave of the pandemic occurred during our influenza season. And so being able to distinguish and differentiate between COVID-19 and influenza uh, was the question we wanted to ask, could we make a testing platform that would allow us to detect and differentiate between these two pathogens that have very similar physical uh, um, uh, symptoms uh, and presentation. Again, because I'm in the Department of Pediatrics, the respiratory syncytial virus is very common in pediatric patients. Uh, and so we built a testing platform where we could, in the same sample, uh, detect influenza A or B, respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV and COVID-19. And this was accomplished by using uh, four different uh, colors, one specific for each respiratory pathogen. And being able to uh, introduce these uh, uh, in the same tube, we could then uh, analyze each pathogen simultaneously in the same tube uh, at 96 uh, well um, throughput or even higher. And so when we, we did this, what we saw again in, in, in rapid order is that the fluorescent signal generated by the matched guide RNA to a particular pathogen, COVID-19, influenza, A or B or RSV, uh, generated a signal only when that uh, corresponding target amplicon was present, that pre was present that was matched to the guide RNA. And by having four different colors, we were able to perform this on the same sample. So uh, we envision a process where uh, lateral flow assays could be performed closer to the point of care, uh, for instance, in doctor's offices in rural areas uh, and using uh, lateral flow assays uh, and amplifying that signal with thermal contrast amplification, uh, as well as being able to uh, improve throughput and sensitivity and being able to differentiate between different uh, respiratory pathogens using the fluorescence multiplex activity. And both are Cas9 based, uh, both binding for lateral flow assays and then binding and cleavage for the fluorescence assay. A key component for this uh, is isolation of uh, the, the analyte. Uh, and again, Dr. Zhang's group has made uh, phenomenal progress in this space because uh, right now, uh, um, uh, COVID-19, either oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal samples are placed in a transport media, uh, typically between one and a half and three mils. Uh, and then only a fraction of that is tested. Uh, but what Dr. Zhang's group has done is enriched the virus particles using magnetic bead technology uh, to condense that uh, transport media volume down to microliter quantities. And so it increases the number of uh, molecules in a smaller space to increase sensitivity uh, by virtue of PCR uh, and lateral flow or fluorescence assay technology. We've also started to do this, again, building off the bead enrichment. These are uh, magnetic beads uh, that have affinity for nucleic acids. They can be introduced into the transport media, uh, exposed to a magnet. That media is then removed, and then uh, nucleic acid um, 
isolating solution can be used to uh, um, isolate the DNA or RNA and then analyze it. Right now, these are done on a uh, tube to tube basis, meaning that it's, it's individualized. Uh, what we're doing is expanding the capability of this to do multiple samples simultaneously in flow. We have aspirations to do this both for patient samples as well as larger population studies uh, because what's becoming more and more frequent is diagnostics um, in populations uh, using wastewater samples uh, that SARS-CoV-2 can be uh, detected in. And so by using these magnetic enrichment beads and being able to automate it and uh, do it at a higher throughput, it will increase sensitivity uh, for these uh, analytical approaches. So overall, what my laboratory's goal was, was to pivot our research using CRISPR-Cas9 uh, to determine whether we could use it in the SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic space uh, with a biotinylated Cas9. <clears throat> We we're able to do that on lateral flow assay technology to fulfill the requirements of a FITC biotin conjugate to detect at a lateral flow assay that uh, sensitivity is improved by thermal contrast uh, amplification. Uh, and from a fluorescence uh, standpoint, using the Cas9 nuclease, we we're able to cleave uh, specific pathogens uh, uh, related probes matched to a, a pathogen sequence that allowed us to do it uh, in real time in uh, a multiplex fashion. Uh, what we're optimizing now is still the thermal contrast reader so that we can uh, have more um, uh, rapid point of collection, lateral flow assay techniques, uh, as well as uh, use magnetic beads or enrichment strategies to increase sensitivity or to do this at a higher throughput, uh, as well as optimizing one pot approaches. So one of the uh, uh, key considerations is the robust nature in which uh, LAMP and RPA DNA amplification occurs, that it's very easy to, uh, because of the robustness of these methodologies, uh, to cross-contaminate work surfaces. Uh, and so being able to do these methodologies with, in a single step uh, would increase uh, both sensitivity as well as accuracy by not having false positives uh, due to contamination, which is a very real concern, particularly with uh, these robust um, amplification technologies such as, as RPA. So these are, are, are conditions that we continue to work on, but uh, again, we built this with every reagent being able to be commercially uh, obtained uh, that we hope will promote uh, expansive diagnostics and, and, and make it more amenable for uh, further refinements and, and improvements. And so again, I just wanna thank my team at the University of Minnesota and collaborators, both regionally, uh, nationally and globally, uh, as well as all of you for your attention, for staying up in the evening uh, and for the kind invitation. I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here and I really appreciate the honor to speak with you today and I am happy to take uh, questions. And there's one question from the the chat, uh, how do the sensitivity and specificity compare to the other non-conventional COVID-19 detection methods, uh, for example, RT LAMP? And so I think that touches on uh, uh, two of the key points we continue to work on. One is, can we simultaneously perform RT uh, RPA or LAMP and detection. And so right now that has been prohibitive through a mechanism we don't fully understand why the Cas9 under these conditions binds, uh, even in the presence of a large excess of this competing material. And so that's something we continue to work on. Right now, I think our assay uh, uh, shows uh, um, in a one pot approach uh, too high of a false positive rate. And so we uncouple those into two reactions. Uh, but I think that what we hope to do is, is devote effort to, to achieve 
a true one pot uh, amplification scenario to avoid these uh, contamination and to simplify it. So right now, uh, the uh, detector in Sherlock can be performed in one pot. We have to do two reactions with ours uh, for mechanisms we don't fully understand yet. Um, and so the, another question is, could, could you elaborate on, um, sorry, elaborate on the application on different COVID-19 variants? And that's an excellent question. So the, uh, our assay was built around an ORF-8A gene variant uh, that was uh, a single nucleotide polymorphism. It was the first variant observed in the United States that subsequently has diminished as uh, uh, certainly the UK, the South African variants. What's interesting about these, and we do analyze this, is that the variants aren't single nucleotide polymorphisms. Oftentimes they have multiple mutations and being able to differentiate them uh, is something we're assessing now because uh, the uh, what differentiates uh, the uh, um, South African strain from the, the UK strain uh, is not always targetable. And that relates in, in our case from a Cas9 perspective relates back to the protospace or adjacent motif that if a mutation or a variant of of concern has this and that's differentiating between the two, then our assay would be able to be uh, uh, amenable for that. Because the variants of concerns have multiple mutations, it becomes somewhat more difficult. So what we're doing is certainly monitoring them from a diagnostic platform from a Cas9 perspective. But we're, what we're also doing is looking at uh, larger sequencing uh, analytics, meaning that we can do whole genome sequencing in a robust manner uh, in the hopes of identifying these variants and then developing a test, whether that's Cas9 based or quantitative RT-PCR based will be due solely to the sequence architecture and whether we can differentiate based on the properties of Cas9, which relates back to the protospace or adjacent motif. I think it's exciting that the there are a number of CAS variants and uh, orthologs that have different PAM requirements. And so I think that uh, uh, in totality, there will be the ability to differentiate these uh, based on the sequence composition. But I think that will be guided by the, the variant of concern sequence. And uh, then a, 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 a follow-up question uh, is, what is actually a sample for LFA, swab or blood or, or something else? So what we did for our LFA was a viral isolate. Uh, that was obtained, we then isolated RNA. Uh, I think that uh, using um, swabs in the uh, particle enrichment, the magnetic particle enrichment uh, is what we hope to uh, transition to next because those are typically what are observed for uh, clinical samples is that either a naso or oral pharyngeal swab are obtained and then used, uh, uh, placed in viral transport media. And that's what I think uh, will uh, employ going forward to be able to enrich for these and then detect them. But the work I presented today was from a, a viral isolate uh, that we obtained and then isolated uh, RNA from. Uh, another question is, there a potential for this method to be used for cancer or congenital disease diagnostics, uh, for example, of certain variations of genes that can cause these conditions? And uh, uh, that's an excellent question. And, and, and certainly, uh, again, my uh, uh, faculty appointment is, is in the division of blood and marrow transplant, where we see a number of, number of these congenital diseases. And so we have built... Um, uh, a corresponding program. What we're uh, doing is biomarker analysis using this technology. Uh, we're very interested in the ability to differentiate between SNPs. Uh, in some of the early uh, Sherlock papers, there was an EGFR SNP that was used for cancer diagnostics. We're interested in pediatric disease biomarker analysis using this. Uh, and, and whether to go back to the previous question, that's uh, using blood. Uh, we're uh, interested in using oral washes too uh, for uh, monitoring um, 
uh, oral cavity cancer, uh, as well as uh, biopsies of the skin, because another condition we uh, observe has a high prevalence of squamous cell carcinoma. So we'd be very interested to apply this both for diagnostics as well as prognostics uh, to be able to ask in real time what is the uh, transcriptional architecture of a particular tumor, uh, either diagnosed or suspected, uh, and then be able to monitor it serially over the course of, of treatment uh, in hopes of, of more streamlined diag diagnostics, monitoring treatment, and then uh, uh, more accurate prognostics for how the treatment may um, uh, uh, affect a, a given tumor. So absolutely, those are questions we're asking now in uh, pediatric uh, acquired and congenital and, and cancer disorders. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. If nobody has any questions, oh, okay, we have one more question. Would, would it be required for a single sample to be tested separately to identify variants? Uh, and that's a, a, a good question. I think that um, what we conceptualize is that, uh, so right now in, in our state, about 70% of the samples that are tested are uh, the UK variant. So I think what will ultimately occur is that whole genome sequencing will define what we're uh, uh, assessing in this case, uh, whether it's the UK variant or not. And so I think the same sample, uh, certainly for a fluorescence detection assay, I think could be uh, tested uh, but I also think that sample could be split for the lateral flow assay and analyzed um, differentially because two different guide RNAs would be required. That being said, uh, there are uh, custom lateral flow assays. And so we have a collaboration with a group that actually constructs lateral flow assays that will allow us then to label um, analytes uh, differentially such that uh, three or four analytes can be read on the same lateral flow assay. That's a more custom approach. And so from a commercial standpoint, I think it would have to be two samples, uh, two tests on the same sample, uh, but we are interested in developing new lateral flow assays with different analytes that allow you to label nucleic acids, proteins uh, uh, in a different manner and, and use them similarly and that they accumulate at a test band. And so those are ongoing studies that we're in, engaged in. If no one has any further questions, I would like to thank Professor Osborne again for holding such, a, such an inspiring lecture today and for giving us such a novel way to look at the uses of CRISPR-based tools. And thank you everyone for being with us today for the last lecture in the CRISPR-Cas series. So with this lecture, we conclude the month dedicated to CRISPR-Cas. And we look forward to seeing everyone soon on some new lectures and workshops. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you for having me and I appreciate the kindness and consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you.